audience, we've got um, people listening in online, and we'd really like to try and make it kind of um, interactive and engaging and have you feel like you're part of the discussion. It's a little hard with the setup, but we would really like to achieve that. So if you wouldn't, we'd be, we'd be very happy. We're not going to force you, but we'd be very happy for people to move closer to the front. Thank you. very nice quiet room um, thank you everybody for staying on for this I know it's been a long day and a long uh, few days um, so we're going to try and make this a bit more sort of interactive and engaging and intimate than um, you know a, a less formal um, uh, event really the, the peer review congress I'm sure we can all agree was absolutely it's my first one I thought it was fantastic I learned a lot I've had some really great conversations um, this event is brought to you by Peer Review Week 2017, which there are a number of people in the room who've been helping with this. I'm the chair of the steering committee um, for Peer Review Week. Uh, this is being live streamed, so welcome to anybody that's out there online listening in to us. Um, we do welcome your contributions as well. We have people monitoring Twitter, so um, please do go ahead and tweet any questions or comments that you might have to the at Peer Rev Week um, Twitter handle using the hashtag Ask PRW. Um, I will introduce our speakers in just a minute. I wanted to take a few minutes, first of all, to tell you a little bit about Peer Review Week. This is our third one. The first one was a very um, makeshift last minute affair in 2015 that was organised by um, Wiley, Sense About Science, Science Open, and ORCID, my organisation. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Support there, Alice Meadows. And um, it was a very last minute sort of, this, wouldn't this be a cool thing to do kind of affair that came out of a conversation with AAAS actually. Um, and it went better than we expected it to and there was a lot of interest from the wider community. So we expanded it last year. And then this year I, I would have to say, um, I think it's the first year that it, it's really come together in a much more uh, sort of structured and also inclusive way, um, which is really what we want. So. One thing to point out about Peer Review Week and indeed about this session um, is that it's, it's very inclusive. Uh, to date, most of the involvement has come from publishers and most of it has come from journals publishers, but we were really delighted this year to have more involvement both from books publishers who were somewhat involved last year and also some from, from some funders and institutions. Um, we have a funder on the panel, which is great. So, um, you know, we... we we want to recognise peer review in all its shapes and forms. We're not particularly pro one flavour of peer review. I think collectively we believe that there's, there's, there's no one size fits all, even if some of us sit in various places along that spectrum. Um, but we also really want um, peer review in all its forms to be recognised, whether it's reviewing a, a journal article or reviewing a grant application or a... Um, a, a tenure promotion application or a conference abstract or whatever it might be. So um, the point of peer review really is to be quite inclusive. Um, we will be running it again next year. This year we've done it to, to coincide with the Peer Review Congress. That was great timing from our point of view and an obvious thing to coincide it with. If you're at all interested either in getting involved in the running of it or in your organisation or you individually participating, please do um, tweet at Peer Rev Week and um, we'll add you to the list for, for next year and that will be wonderful. So I think that's enough on Peer Review Week and we'll talk a bit now about this session. The theme of Peer Review Week, as you probably know, is transparency and peer review. So that's this session is called Under the Microscope, Transparency and Peer Review. Uh, we've got a really great panel. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that we've got such great people um, here to talk with us. So on my right, on your left, we have Irene Hames, who 
is described here as an independent peer review and publication ethics advisor. We had her down as an expert, and I think that's still what we would like to call her, but she very modestly <laughs> insisted, um, I which I've now ruined. <laughs> um, but Irene, um, I'm sure many of you already know, if not in person, then um, for her many writings and general experience of, of um, peer review, which she shares very generously with many of us. So I'm delighted to welcome you, Irene. Um, next to Irene is Elizabeth Moylan, who's um, senior editor for for research integrity at Biomed Central, um, also somebody who's very well known on the sort of the peer review circuit and very knowledgeable. Um, Biomed Central, of course, is one of the first open access publishers, and they've got a great track record of experimenting with different forms of peer review. On uh, your right, Andrew Preston, who's the founder and managing director of Publons. Um, Publons has also um, really helped pull together Peer Review Week this year, and they are celebrating with. Um, their Sentinel Awards. Um, Irene is one of the finalists for that and um, Retraction Watch also, actually, who are here somewhere, I think, um, and, and a couple of other organisations. Um, so uh, Publons, I think it's fair to say, in a very short space of time, have had a real impact on uh, scholarly peer review. And then last but not least, Carly, whose job title I'm going to have to read. <laughs> Sorry, Carly. Um, who is Programme Officer of the Data Driven Discovery Initiative at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So um, a, a funder on the panel, as I say, which is a really interesting addition for us so that we can begin to broaden our conversation out beyond publishing. Um, they uh, are each going to start off in a minute by telling you a little bit about uh, their perspective on peer review and particularly on transparency in peer review. But we wanted to kick this off by just asking all of you, and it would be great if anybody listening on in the live stream could tweet as well, um, who in this room has in any way been, has anybody actually participated in open peer review in any way? Have you, any of you done open peer review? Great, quite a, quite a lot of people. Is there anybody who feels that you, it's definitely something that you wouldn't be interested in? And there's no judgment here, but I think it's something, something that people do feel have strong feelings about both ways. No? Okay, and uh, um, yes, the other thing we wanted to see is just who, the, the makeup of the audience. So um, do we have any researchers in the audience? Yep. Publishers? Librarians? Okay, so nice mix. Great. Well, as I say, welcome all. We're going to come back and ask you a few more questions towards the end of the um, session. And we re I can't um, iterate too much the fact that we would like to have you involved in this session. We'll have roving mics. Um, we want to keep it as informal as possible. So please, no questions too stupid, no comment is too um, banal. We would love to have you join in this and make this more of a discussion rather than a formal, uh, formal presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to hand off to Irene, who's going to tell us a little bit about her take on transparency and peer review. Uh, thank you, Alice. Um, well, to me, transparency means a number of things from a number of perspectives. So first of all, you have the journal. And all journals should be able to tell people what peer, kind of peer review they're doing, what are their processes. And they should make this information very clear. And too often with journals, they may think that they relay this information, but they don't. So you want to know about their policy requirements, also the kind of screening they do. And so people can assess, is this being done in a fair way for textual duplication or image checking? Um, from the author, you want transparency. You want to know about their funding, whether they have any potential conflicts of interest, but also about the research materials that they're using, because so much of the research, well, a lot of research um, in the life sciences, people are doing research on cell lines, things like that, that, <clears throat> that are not actually what they think they are. So we're moving into the era of there being persistent identifiers for materials, resource um, identifiers. Um, timelines. Journals will tell you a time that they operate the peer review process, but it's often not accurate. And I always advise people to go actually go and look at the dates with, within a journal. So again, we need to know about this. And I was actually shocked by a paper, um, Huseman and Smith's in 2016, Scientrometrics. They analyzed data from three and a half thousand review experiences submitted by authors. Um, and the shocking statistic was that desk editorial rejects, rejects without review, a sixth of journals take more than four weeks. Now there's no excuse for that. That should happen relatively quickly, but nobody is publicizing that kind of um, time. 
it's not fair to the authors. So all those things are very straightforward. But to me, increasingly, because I read articles, I also review for articles, and sometimes when I um, see the other reviewers' reports, I'm actually quite shocked at how minimal or how poor they are. Um, so I increasingly want to see the reviewers' reports with the papers that I read. Not the identification of the reviewers, that's up to people to decide, journals to decide in their own communities, to decide on their own, but I definitely would like to see the reports. Uh, EMBO Journal has been doing this since 2009 uh, in, a, in a very good way. If anyone's not familiar with the kind of things, <clears throat> how it's done. There is a cost involved in time uh, and resources in getting these things together, but I think they can be done relatively simply in this day and age. So I want to throw out um, a sort of challenge to people. You know, I've not heard from anybody, why should it not become the norm for every single journal to publish reviewers' reports? Editorial correspondence, um, the editor's decision, I'm not talking all editorial correspondence, because not all of it should be um, published and the uh, author's response. So please people sort of here, people who are, who are watching or people who are tweeting, I'd love to hear reasons because I think everyone should do that. And to me, it is the most simple, obvious solution to the predatory journal problem. We have all these complex checklists. People can lie about those. You, I've, I, even I have trouble trying to distinguish some genuine from predatory questionable journals. And I've been in the business for 40 years now. If all journals that were, that were legitimate published the review's report, people would instantly know. This, review, this journal doesn't have any reviewer's reports. Why? Because everyone else does. So I would love to know that. So that is my sort of mission, to try and get as many journals as possible to, to have those. Um, and I'm just going to end on a historical note, because that's been a theme through this conference, which has been absolutely brilliant to find out about peer, peer review from the past. And it's actually a quote from Eileen Fife. Is that, Eileen's probably not here. She, so I, it's a paper from Eileen Fife with Noah Moxon that um, was accepted for publication in, in May. And the Duke of Sussex, who was the president of the Royal Society, said in 1832, referring to written reports and practices of foreign societies, that public reports were often more valuable than the original communications upon which they are founded. And to me, that also, if you publish the reports, you start the discussion going. They're not hidden. Um, and they're also, obviously, an educative tool. So thank you. I'm going to share your mic. <laughs> Um, so, I wouldn't disagree with what, what you were saying, but if I was asked um, what's meant by transparent peer review, I'd probably wear my BMC hat and stick to what we mean by different models of peer review. So, for me, transparent peer review is when a, an article has been peer reviewed and published, the referee reports accompany publication of that article. Um, however, it's just the content of the reviewer report that's shown to the public, no information about the reviewer name. So that for me is the sort of definition of what is meant by transparent peer review. So just the content shown, but not the reviewer name. And in thinking a little bit about this and, and uh, chatting with colleagues, I wonder if there are sort of shades of transparency that journals operate because um, again, um, from the BMC perspective, when I started at BMC, which was in 2004, I was a handling editor on the BMC series of journals, and the biology journals operated single blind peer review, but the medical journals operated open peer review. And <laughs> we heard earlier on that there are many definitions of open peer review. So open peer review was that um, authors get to know who the reviewers are because the reports are named. So if a manuscript was rejected, the author would still see um, who the reviewers were, um, but if the article was accepted for publication, then those reports would accompany publication, just as in transparent peer review, but they'd be signed. So they'd be fully open, so it's almost pushing that transparency further. And um, there are also different um, variants of peer review. Some journals, Nature and Frontiers, will publish the reviewer names on the article, but not the reports. So that's another different flavour, and I don't know if that actually has a name for that kind of review. So I think there are these different sort of shades of transparency. Um, that's what I'd, I'd say, thank you. Hello everybody. Um, so 
I think transparency is kind of a weird thing to define, so maybe we could start by saying what's not transparent, um, kind of what's the status quo. So for me, if I think about peer review in a kind of a non-transparent way, I'm thinking of a journal-based process where um, review may or may not be happening, but once the review is completed and then uh, kind of a publishing decision has been made, that review lives in that silo and remains there and nothing useful ever happens with it again. So, you know, it's kind of um, if, a, if a tree falls in the forest, does a tree really fall? So that would be my example of what's not transparent review. But I think anything beyond that is moving us in the direction of transparency. Um, so an example of a, of a small move would be something that Publons does, for example. You can recognize reviewers, so you can show reviewers or, or show the fact that reviewers have been contributing to a review process and behind the scenes you can verify that it's happening without necessarily showing which paper they reviewed or the content of the review that they, um, that they, that they wrote. But you're still bringing some transparency to the process. You can see who is reviewing for a journal. You can see how much people are reviewing. You can start to reward them for their contributions to the, to the scholarly ecosystem. So even little things, I think, add to the transparency in the system and can start to drive efficiency um, and improve the overall um, way that we work as scholars. But of course, it extends all the way to fully transparent, kind of open peer review, where maybe you sign your name to to the manuscript that you're reviewing and you release the content of your review. But there's a whole spectrum there, and I think anything that moves beyond the journal-based silo, um, which actually does a pretty good job of peer review, is, is, um, is moving us towards transparency. So there's a continuum. So uh, I, I am the only funder uh, on the panel, and I'm uh, not planning on speaking uh, for all the funders ever, and maybe not even just for the Moore Foundation, but um, I'm here partly because I have a lot of interest in scholarly communication. I worked at the California Digital Library before I was at the Moore Foundation and thought a lot about uh, promoting open science and how to facilitate conversations about accelerating the speed of research. And so um, at the Moore Foundation, working with the Data Driven Discovery Initiative, um, we don't tend to fund a lot of things that look like scholarly communication, but we do fund things like the Jupyter Notebook, which um, is part of that um, kind of ecosystem. We also uh, think a lot about um, alternative research products, and so how do we give credit for the researchers that we fund that tend to work on things like software or, um, or maybe uh, do a lot of reviews, and we want to figure out how to give them credit. Uh, and, and take into account the fact that they're doing these various other uh, acts of service alongside their, um, alongside their kind of typical manuscript publication. And um, uh, interestingly, we don't actually have a proposal review process at the Moore Foundation. Um, it depends on the group that you're looking at, but within the science program, which is what I work on, um, we don't tend to operate as a um, call for proposals where we then send out for um, review. We tend to use our network of people that we know in the community and ask for feedback um, and occasionally convene uh, review panels. So it's a little bit of a different model than potentially some of the other funders that are uh, more prevalent in the biomedical kind of research space. But um, I know that uh, transparency and peer review is something that's very important um, to, to me because of the open science aspects of the things that I've been thinking about over the last 10 years. But um, interestingly, it's something to think about in terms of uh, funders in general. I think there's a lot of a lack of transparency in the way that funders uh, tend to, to work, particularly private funders and philanthropy organizations like the Moore Foundation or the Sloan Foundation or the Arnold Foundation. Um, there's a lot of black boxes and um, that's something that I personally would love to change about the Moore Foundation. Um, it's not always easy to affect change in an organization that has kind of a way of doing things, which I'm sure is familiar to the publishers in the room. So. Great, thanks all. So, so that was kind of everybody setting out their position, if you like, setting out their wares for this session. We're going to start off with a kind of fun question for everyone, and then after that, um, I'm going to be hopefully cool. Some of you will... will um, joining the fun as well. So our first question for everybody was, um, what's a kind of interesting slash fun slash shocking fact about peer review that you would like to share with the audience? So I'm going to start with Carly, actually. Okay. Uh, so um, I just wanted to mention that um, something that uh, the Crossref organization has just recently announced, which is that they're planning on um, providing 
uh, persistent identifiers for peer review. And so um, that goes a long way towards uh, being able to pair the actual um, reviews that go with the papers alongside the papers themselves and really thinking about the broader network of research outputs that go alongside any publication, whether it's data, software, code, whatever. But um, in this case, it's really interesting to think about um, the fact that Crossref is providing this bit of recognition um, by giving it a DOI, which I think will really help facilitate more open peer review. Also, I'll also point out, um, so for quite a while now, for published reviews on publons, there has been the ability to get D DOIs, and we haven't had the ability to use the, the review type. So the Crossref announcement is cool, because now we can migrate all of the DOIs that we have over to the review type. So it's something we've been looking forward to for a while. Um, so fun fact, I, I was trying to think about something to do with um, transparency, and kind of that definition of the continuum of transparency. Um, and, and kind of point to the sorts of things we can start to understand if we do bring some transparency to peer review. So one of the issues that seems to exist in peer review, at least journal and I think grant-based peer review at the moment, is people are very worried about the increasing burden that we're placing on reviewers. So more and more work is being laid on reviewers to review. Um, and there's also some concern that some small fraction of the research community is, um, is kind of taking on more and more um, of that burden, so an unequal burden um, of, of uh, peer review requirements. Um, but so how can you measure this? How can you know what's going on? So we, um, with Publons, have a database of more than a million reviews now from 200,000 or so reviewers. And um, inspired by the concept of income inequality, um, where you can measure the level of income equality, inequality between countries, we came up with a measure for, for measuring what we call review inequality. So it's a measure of, um, in a given country or a given research field, um, what proportion of researchers are contributing um, to, to most of the review, basically. Um, so there's a measure for this you can, you can d determine called the Gini coefficient. Um, and it's very interesting to look at countries. So if you look at Australia or the US um, or a whole range of countries, the Gini coefficient, or the level of reviewer burden or reviewer inequality, is very, very similar across country. So that's interesting because countries have quite different funding um, ecosystems and everything. But the really interesting thing, and this is the, kind of the fun fact, is if you look at research fields, so switch from looking at countries to research fields, and you look at the burden that's placed on reviewers, um, if you look at um, biomed, there's actually relatively low burden. So the workload is spread pretty evenly um, across reviewers in the biomed field. But if you look at chemistry and engineering, so some of these more um, kind of STEM-ish uh, subjects, um, the burden is much more concentrated. So the inequality or the burden on some reviewers is much higher in those research fields. I think that's a really interesting kind of um, something strange is going on in different, different research fields. That's my fun fact. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. I was struggling for fun and I was, <laughs> I don't know if it's just a fact. Um, so we've heard a few things earlier on in the conference. Uh, th I think it was um, that there's, there's many shades to open peer review um, and that peer review might not be as old as we would imagine. Um, but we ha probably haven't talked a little bit about who's doing the peer review. And it's something that I don't know if publishers can really get at, but um, the publishers in the audience might be able to share. Um, but I did find a blog written by Yana Sapanen, who founded Peerage of Science, um, where he was investigating who was doing peer review in his system. So of the reports, I think this was dating back to 2013, of the reports in his um, system, he looked up who was doing the reports and at what stage in the career they were. Um, he just Googled them. And uh, it, it turns out that postdocs were doing most of the review. So that was my fun fact. <laughs> Right, well, my, my interesting fact is the answer to the question, what is the average length of a peer review? And this stems from an infographic that Publons produced um, for their 2016 data in January 2017. So Andrew last week kindly provided me with up-to-date data. So based on more than 200,000 verified reviews from the first round of review, not, not revisions, and 
didn't matter whether they were published, you know, I mean, open or closed on the sites, that the mean is 457 words and the median 321 words. Now, to me, when I see that figure, and I actually, when I give talks, I've got a slide where I create a block of text that length, and it is actually very short. So it really surprised me, almost shocked me, that it should be that, that, that short. Length of peer review doesn't equate to quality, because you could have pages and pages of someone who's just done basically sort of copy editing. But I don't think, personally, that in 457 words, you can do the kind of peer review that, that, that you know, we should aspire to, because we're not just giving a recommendation, you should publish this, you shouldn't, a few things. The whole purpose of peer review is to also give the author the feedback to make the research sounder, better, and, and, a, and a really good journal can become part of the community and actually direct research direction and make it better than it is and with policy. So this to me was really, really surprising. Um, I've got anecdotal sort of evidence, which I might bring up later, not evidence, and anecdotal stories um, about that. I see tweets, you know, people saying about the quality of review. Do people think that the quality of peer review is going down? Is it more minimal? Are people rushing it? You know, and I think that would be a really interesting thing to explore. I'm not aware of people doing this kind of research. If anyone has any information on that, I think it would be really interesting. It would actually be really interesting to combine that with Andrew's research and find out whether in those... Um, uh, subject disciplines that there's a yeah. lot of inequality, whether it corresponds with a, a shorter re peer reviews. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a bit of research that's waiting to happen. Okay, so this is where I was threatened. We're going to hopefully get some of you involved. So first of all, I'd like to invite any of you to comment on anything that you've heard so far. Do you have uh, some inf uh, a sort of fun or interesting fact of your own you'd like to share? Um, we will have, as I say, a roving mic. If anybody... Um, uh, brings anything up on uh, the live stream, we'll share that here as well. So any, any takers for being the first person to, to dare to say something? Um, is that on? Uh, um, Tim Vines, uh, both Origin Editorial. Uh, I had once had a author request that we overturn the rejection decision on their paper because they needed to get married and if we didn't accept the paper they couldn't get married. So. <laughs> I think that, that might be the funnest fact that we hear all night. With respect to the question of whether or not the peer review burden is increasing, uh, we published a paper uh, in RIPA, Research Integrity Peer Review, uh, earlier this year, and then we had to re promptly rebut it. But the rebuttal was actually a lot better than the, the first paper, and that showed that across six very large ecology journals, so a substantial fraction of the peer review that was going on in ecology, uh, the proportion of people receiving more than one review request per year was flat. The proportion of people receiving um, the average number of review requests per person per year from this is from 20, 2004 all the way to 2016, was flat. So that these journals, at least, these five, six journals, were not asking their reviewers to do any more than they were a decade earlier. But the reviewer agreement rate, by pretty much whatever measure you wanted, was declining from something like 60% down to 45% and shows no sign of letting up. Um, so you have to ask that many more people. So the reviewer burden is being spread thinner. Everyone's being asked pretty much the same amount. Um, but we're asking more and more people because people are declining more and more. Any other comments or questions? Hmm? Thanks. Um, Ivan Ransky from uh, Refraction Watch. Um, just want to sort of second and maybe um, put some, uh, a little finer point on something Irene uh, recommended, um, which uh, you will not be surprised to hear that Weight Retraction Watch would heartily endorse, which is publishing uh, every, you know, publishing peer reviews and maybe some correspondence. Can I make, a, can I uh, give what I hope is a friendly uh, amendment to that or sort of suggestion that might, um, might actually happen, although I really doubt it, uh, which is when a paper is retracted, um, there should maybe someone could recommend that actually all of those uh, peer reviews are published. 
Um, that would be a start. Uh, you can sort of hope that no one will leak them to us, uh, but often they will. And, uh, you know, we just think that this is clearly in some way, whether it was because of actual malfeasance or just somebody missed something or, or just an error, um, peer review did not go the way it should have. Uh, so as a particular use case, may we recommend that uh, just in, th in those cases, let's start there, uh, that the, the reviews are released. It was the, um, uh, the was it the Asnic Life paper a few years ago that the the reviews were added to public domain. That was really quite cool. Um, actually, just an observation on um, kind of why reviews aren't released to be read. Um, we've done some surveys within Publons about this to try to understand. This came up earlier today. And I kind of wanted to make a comment. If you ask a reviewer why they wouldn't want the content of their reviews to be published. They usually say, um, at least the people we spoke to, they usually say, well, and more than 50%, when I say usually, I say more than 50%, they say, well, I don't think the editor would like that. And if you go and ask the editor, the editor will say, well, I don't think the author would like that. <laughs> and if you go and ask the author, the author usually says, well, I don't care. Um, so I think actually what one of the things that's going on here is there's a bit of a coordination problem in, in the ecosystem. There's a lot of people you've got to work together with to to kind of make this happen, which isn't to say we shouldn't be doing it, but that may be one of the underlying causes of it. We have a question that came in from Twitter um, from Stephanie Dawson. Should peer reviewers assess importance? Okay, so, well, let's move on to that. Um, um, well, peer reviewers should assess what the organization or the person they're reviewing for has asked them to do, because that's going to vary. So there will be journals that don't want importance assessed at that point. You know, when you're reviewing for soundness, everybody should review for soundness and ethical uh, completion. But some journals do want an assessment of that, and that's up to them. And that, that aspect and how important it is will change with time. But everyone is entitled to make it, you know, to give that opinion during peer review if they are asked for it. They may be proved right, they may be pr proved wrong. So I think it just depends who, you know, what people are asking you to do. Um, I wanted to comment, part, I think it's related to that, but um, also it's related to this question around um, making public reviews of uh, manuscripts that do end up uh, being retracted, which um, as a former researcher, I, I feel like um, I'm obligated to say I would stop reviewing as many manuscripts if that was the case because it would feel like I'm on the hook for a level of scrutiny that would require two to three times more time. I mean, I, I write what I would like to think are quality peer reviews when I do review papers and I think I spend enough time on them, but am I um, giving them the amount of diligence I would give them if I were a co-author or if I um, you know, knew that if they were gonna be retracted, I would basically be um, kind of skewered in the community, I, then I would, I would probably review a lot less. Um, that's just my perspective on that. Okay. So um, if there's nothing else in the room, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of switch between questions in the room and questions that we either get on Twitter or that we've already got on Twitter. So that was the first Twitter one. So does anybody have a question in the room? Sorry, Chris, we're making you run around. <laughs> you always just uh, jump to the... Yeah. I would like to know what the panel thinks of uh, publishing reports for papers that are not published. Because let's say we move towards more transparency where all the papers that are published have their reports with them. But like, at least for some of the journals, such as the journals I work for, like the majority of the papers are not being published. And then, you know, how, how do we account for that? Because if it, you know, if you, the fact that you don't publish reports of papers that are rejected will, can, can mask, you know, things that went wrong in that peer review and maybe pa papers that were unfairly rejected and this will never surface if, if the paper is not published because we don't publish the you know, it's, it's a bit circular argument, but I hope you get the gist. I just want to know what you think we can do in that sense. 
That's really tricky, Elisa. <laughs> um, I think that speaks to um, confidentiality of the review process, and it's, I think that's really a good question. Um, I've chatted with Pete Binfield about this before because he was of the mind that um, if, if you've been a reviewer for a manuscript and you've flagged some issues with it, say that it's not a big enough sample to address the question, and then you see that paper published elsewhere, um, the sample size has mysteriously grown, you've got this sort of ethical dilemma that you want to respect the confidentiality of the review process of the previous journal, but ethically you feel like speaking up. And the, these are sort of very tricky um, situations. I sort of wonder whether preprints may help us out here and if everybody was very open about what they were doing and put their work on a preprint server, then it's much easier then um, for other people to communicate about that. So whether there's a role for preprints in this. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are some peer review workflows that for both the open and the, for the rejected and accepted manuscripts, you see the review. So F1000 being the canonical example. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it, do, it does exist. And it is an interesting point, because you, if you're talking about transparency and review, but you're only showing reviews for published papers, that's inherently a biased sample. The other problem, of course, is um, the complete lack of efficiency in that process. If you're doing all of this review, and then the paper goes on to be published somewhere else, but you're throwing away those reviews, it's incredibly inefficient. And again, it comes back to this coordination problem that we have in research, where it's very hard to coordinate between all these players and it leads to like, you know, huge amounts of waste, basically. And that's where transparency is really important and comes in. And, and there are initiatives trying to address that. And the neuroscience journals and the neuroscience consortium, you know, do are willing to share peer review reports between journals, but it's very much author-led. When yeah, so there are very low take up. I mean, because that project has been around for mm. for quite a while. I mean, the w one good thing is now people can get credit for the reviews that are rejected because before no one would have known, they wouldn't, but obviously on problems, you get credit, don't you? And um, w with ORCID, for the review that you've done, it won't, won't, won't be visible. Um, but it is a real problem sometimes when you, you have reports that have rejection and then you, you, you see them or someone has sent you the previous one with their, with, with their, um, they say, I've reviewed it for someone else, here's my report I did there. And you see the report, I mean, you haven't asked them for it, but they've sent it voluntarily. And there was something in that, that the way the authors addressed it was just to remove what would appear problematical, but the basic problem was still there. Um, so peer review is a very nuanced thing, you know, and it involves a lot of intelligent and smart thinking. And people tend to think it's just, being able to use an online system. And although online systems have a, a terrific introduction um, to this thing, it also, I think, in some cases, may people or some publishers feel, oh, we can just do this really quickly because you just need to know how to use one of the manuscript submission systems. But each step, um, to avoid waste, you have to engage this and common sense. And I saw another statistic on one of the posters. It was one from, from Elsevier because they looked again at um, the reasons why people um, turn down invitations. And I've seen this statistic in other ones. And 25% turn them down because the paper they've been asked to review is out of scope. Now that shouldn't never, ever happen. Obviously it's gonna happen some of the time because you're not going to be able to target immediately. And I have heard researchers say, that they actually sometimes tell a journal it's out of scope because they don't want to review it, but I'm hoping that's a, a minimal thing. So there's waste there, and I think all of us could identify many areas where we could reduce waste. And I also don't like the practice, um, well, it's actually unethical. Um, speed seems to count for everything now, and I think we're almost reaching the limit of what the expectation should be. We, you know, scientists have, like, researchers have, have lives, editorial offices are rushed off their feet. If you invite people more than you need, it's fine to um, take the first, you know, if you need the first two, then to write to the other people and with courtesy, because, you know, courtesy is a big part of uh, peer review, and say, yes, thank you, you know, can we keep you on hold if we need you? But I have heard of a number of cases where people actually invite 
and send the manuscript to more people than they need. Then they stop the peer review process when the first two come in. And then they send an email to the people who are still reviewing saying, oh, we don't need it anymore. This is shocking. It's, it's a waste of effort, but it's so discourteous, and I think it is unethical. It's also stupid, because the reviews that are going to come back quickly are probably the more superficial ones anyway. And I've met early career researchers who have fretted about this privately, because they daren't contact the editor. And I just say to them, you don't have to review for those journals if you don't want to. That is a terrible way to treat you, because they've been compiling a great rev bit of reviews. So we have wastage in so many different areas. So I think we need to, to address that. Is, is this another question or is this a comment? Okay, can I hold it just for a minute and we'll go to Twitter and then come back. Um, I'm going to go to a question that we received earlier on Twitter. Um, actually, two questions and you may want to answer one or both parts of it. So the first part was around um, how do we balance cause coming up because um, you mentioned preprint servers, preprints as being possibly one solution to this issue. So I think we can segue into that question. Um, how can we balance concerns about preprint servers, such as the risk of publishing non-validated data, against the need for transparency? And then a kind of lead-on from that, will the rise in preprints push more portable peer review? So I don't know who would like to have a go at answering one or both of those. Um, well, I can say that I'm, I've been a part of the ASAP bio discussions, and so um, I'm squarely in the camp of preprints are good. Um, and I think that uh, it's a, f a bit of a, um, a red herring to, to talk about um, the potentially unvalidated quality or um, uh, value of things that are, print are published as preprints first. Um, there's certainly plenty of things that do go through the peer review process that aren't necessarily great or um, valuable or um, high high level, but um, that that doesn't stop us from continuing to try, right? And so I think in some ways um, preprints are part of this virtuous cycle of communicating out our scholarly outputs and um, doing it as openly and transparently and as quickly as possible. And so uh, in that sense, I think that in, in some ways they're going to open up the conversation about uh, peer review even more than it has been by groups like you guys, uh, because it's causing the researcher community as well as the publisher and funder and other communities to really think about uh, what's the value of peer review? What does it bring to the table? Um, how can we make sure that it's uh, as, as valuable as possible? And how do we incorporate that into not just the, the way that we think about research, but also into the technology platforms that we have um, that we're using and that uh, in particular that are kind of cropping up now that we have all of these preprint servers going into place. Um, as regards to the um, preprint question, I mean, I think um, Harlan Crummels gave a very good um, plenary this morning and answered some of the things. I think if, if everybody knows what they're reading, um, you know, um, with preprints, then that's the safeguard. And you have to make it very clear. But, but, and it'll vary from discipline to discipline. So I think it's the responsibility of the people who are setting up preprint servers, especially now there is a big rush of people to do. And I should say I'm very pro preprint -pre servers. Um, but for example, I just had a quick look at um, a couple of them. PeerJ preprints does not accept submissions which have diagnostic, therapeutic, or health implications or report on clinical trials. They've made it absolutely clear what they don't um, Except, and obviously people have to then screen at the initial, initial, initial stage. Um, uh, Paleo Archive um, just started a few weeks ago, so again, they have got their own specific guidance to their researchers because they're dealing with taxonomic submissions, and there are very specific rules and guidance on w when you publish and how you publish with that. So again, they have given advice to authors. So I think that kind of quality um, information which a lot of traditional journals don't, don't give because their information for authors have become almost impenetrable. You know, instead of reanalyzing them, looking at them every year, you just sort of keep on adding things ad hoc as they come up. So I wouldn't worry about, you know, the, the dangers of sort of preprints because as long as they are labeled exactly what they are and you know what you're reading. And, it, and it's clear that they're unpeer reviewed in a sense um, and it's great when you can read comments alongside mm. and, and many are named comments as well and, and enrich a paper and then that can be re revised and then submitted to a journal if that's what people wish to do. Some people don't and they consider their preprint as their publication. Mm. 
Um, yeah. I'll just say, I'll say one thing about preprint service, which is, um, you know, often when we talk about them and the possibility of review layered on top and all these sorts of things, we tend to ignore the editor in all of this. You don't often hear about preprint servers where there's editor or input involved. I think one of the things we've certainly learned, and I think that's really important, is that editors play a really important role in all of this. And so, yeah, I think that preprints by and large are good and bring transparency to the system and, you know, as long as you know what's going on, you can make your own decisions. But there needs to be more discussion around the role of the editor in this stuff. So, just. Yep. So, uh, I'm Evan May Wilson. I work at the Center for Clinical Trials and Evidence Synthesis at Johns Hopkins. And um, I kind of appreciate that preprints may have a role in some fields and that they're very beneficial in many areas. For clinical trials, when we ask guideline developers or systematic reviewers to use information, um, we're asking them to use a trial registration, the results reported on clinicaltrials.gov or another registry, a clinical study report, a statistical analysis plan, a trial protocol, often more than one paper about the results and the methods of the clinical trial. They're supposed to look at conference abstracts. There's a, a mountain of sources that are incomplete, contradictory, and just generally unhelpful about clinical trials. And many of those sources are already being used by people who manufacture drugs and devices in order to promote materials that are not scientifically credible materials. And so preprints in clinical trials seem to me to be another source of information that is very likely to be confusing and contradictory. And unless we're very careful, I'm worried that you know these efforts to put more sources and more information out there is not actually going to be beneficial. It's going to be counterproductive and it's going to undermine our efforts to make information more usable, more available, and more transparent. I mean, as a counter example, there's all sorts of issues with reproducibility at the moment and, you know, for example, psychology, where statistical power is a big problem under underpowered studies. Um, you, know, you know, I think these sorts of things happen, you know, whether it's with preprint servers or published research, I don't think there's like a, an automatic cutoff here where you can use a study that's been peer reviewed and published um, in a way that it probably doesn't need, shouldn't be used. So I think, a, I think a, for me, it would be more around education of the issues than necessarily saying that one thing is, is good or bad. So just a counterpoint. Um, can I just add real quickly that um, somebody uh, mentioned in the, in the conference earlier that um, the uh, amount of information isn't the problem, it's the filter, you need a better filter. And so um, I'm very much an advocate for um, provide all the information, make it as open and available as possible, um, and then educate people and um, help them understand how to gauge the quality of that work or provide tools or ways to, um, to facilitate people really um, taking that into account when they review those types of things. So the, the trouble with that is that that's a person's time. So if we had a machine that could sort through all of this stuff and tell us what the truth was, that would be great. But every time we add another layer, when we're doing systematic reviews, when we're trying to synthesize this evidence and figure out what the actual results of a clinical study were, we're asking a person to do that. And so the development process for a systematic review or a clinical guideline is already taking years today. Adding more sources of information and more stuff is just going to lengthen that process. I think we might have had another comment at the back. Did somebody have the? Oh, and sorry. Okay. Okay. Is that me? Um, can I read something out? Um, it's also a fun fact. Um, I do have a question as well. I wanted to read a, re a response to a review request I sent a long time ago. It says, baby, I'm standing on the edge of the harbour in Penzance, waiting <laughs> to take the ferry. Um, now I'm going past the, the beautiful cliffs of the Scilly Isles, all of my love. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a response to a, re a review request we sent a long time ago. <laughs> so we wrote back and said, uh, as ever in love, we're never quite sure the answer is yes or no. <laughs> but anyway, my question um, to you was, so you, you're talking about posting, as part of transparency, to post reviews um, 
of the published papers, does that include those reviews make most sense when you can see the previous version, because then you can see what the reviewer's talking about. Um, and then presumably that previous version was written in response to previous rounds of review. So do you, should the whole thing, like every round of review, the previous version, the previous round of review, the previous version, no matter how many iterations it went round, should all of that be available? Or do you just mean the previous, the last set of reviews the manuscript received before it was accepted? So at BMC, we don't uh, um, put, we make the original version available um, just through uh, fears of um, anything being shared that shouldn't be shared at that stage. And then we do share the review reports under open peer review and the author's point-by-point -point response and the revised version then. And if there are rounds of re-review, everything again since then. Um, F1000 um, show everything, so the initial version and the post-publication peer reviews and, and revised versions. But yeah, I, I think as much as possible is a good thing. Just before we move off of um, preprints, I think Jessica, you also wanted to make a comment or? Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to um, briefly comment on this notion that preprints are increasing the amount of information that one must deal with. I totally agree that they are adding more papers uh, in the, their preliminary state. Um, my, I think the expectation, though, is that uh, th those who are reading those papers will just look to the final published version of record, and you know, ultimately, we're not necessarily making those papers available, more doubling the number of papers, but rather making some version available earlier. So I, I see the utility as the, of the preprint really as existing before the date of formal publication, although I think if there's material that's cut out, um, it can get much more complicated. Okay, thank you. I was just going to ask uh, Elizabeth, actually, because um, MboJ, they once gave an estimate um, of the amount of time it takes, and I don't know if it's, it's still right, because they create a PDF um, file in, I can't remember, it, I think it's called a transparency file now. So they compile it, and it, I think it, it said it was one and a half hours per paper. So for BMC, which is, like, it's very, very nice the way the, you know, you click on the reviews, because I often do, do look at those. Is that done very quickly, automatically? How is it done, or is there what, what's the kind of investment of time and effort into that? Do you know? I, I, I would have to ask our production yeah. department because it's it's not shown in real time as, as it is with F1000 research. It's only shown once the decision is taken mm -hmm. to accept and publish the paper, and then that's just compiled and put online. But um, there is a physical compilation by somebody. How o automated that now is, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's automated um, for each paper, so, but I don't know, if, I don't know, it would be good to go back and ask that question, yeah. Because I think, um, you know, if, if we have any sort of hope of having transparency in reviews, it's got to be something that is not too, that requires too much effort because editorial offices, editors, journals have so many things now that they have to do that they didn't used to, you know, textual duplication checking, image checking, which a lot of people don't don't do and if that mm. is going to take a lot of effort that will be just such a hurdle you know i can't imagine it will because we've got 70 journals under open peer review so right. it, it must be automated but i don't know what the steps are if, if it's if it's a minute per manuscript or, or I'll, longer i'll just add to that so with yeah. most editorial management systems we have a, like an integration where it doesn't require any manual interaction it, you know yeah, it takes a few seconds but of course it depends from an editorial and a production point of view what you want to add and improve on that. But it, like technically, it's, it's yeah. free. Yeah. So. Okay, before we move on to the next question from the room, which I think was at the front here, is there any, are there any comments or anything on Twitter that we can share? There are no questions at the moment. Okay, great. So I think we have a question down at the front. Oh, okay. Uh, we have a question at the, okay. Thank Hi. you, we have a question at the back instead then. Oh, sorry. I'm in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, my name is Emily. I'm from Portland. Um, I wanted to go back to this issue of the editor, which I felt was coming up in your initial comments, Irene, about um, Sorry, what was the first thing you said uh, about editors, editors, the role of editors coming up. Um, so I have a, f 
a fun fact, personal story wrapped up in a comment, wrapped up in a question. <laughs> um, about four or five years ago, I had an acceptance with no revisions and from a university press journal. Um, to date, it's been my most highly impactful article. Um, when I asked the editor for the peer reviewer's comments, I never received an email back from the editor. Um, so in terms of one reason people may not want to publish reviews is who knows what kind of power an editor may be nefariously wielding. I, I think this is an outlying example. Um, I just happen to have experienced it directly. Um, but I think we need to acknowledge that being an editor is an inherent power structure. Um, and so the, that, and I don't think, and I, there is still quite an editorial role when it comes to peer review and working with journals. I don't think we can push it off to just be all post-publication commentary by community, which is an argument that I have seen out there in the literature. But I guess the question is to make it to make review as, peer review as transparent as possible, we also need to be making editor's decisions as transparent as possible. And I was wondering, so now we're at the question portion of my fun experience commentary. Um, I was wondering if any of you, I haven't seen, but if any of you have seen models where um, editors are making those decisions transparent or if there is a decision matrix or anything that's been shared in that regard or if that's something that maybe the scholarly publishing community in general um, could be coming up with. And I will also say with a caveat that I am a librarian and a social scientist, so um, I don't do checklists as much as most of the clinical colleagues here in the room. Um, so that's my well, perspective. It's interesting you raise the issue of editor transparency because um, this is actually a big issue. And when we were doing the first draft of the COPE, ethical guidelines for peer reviewers. Um, I, I drafted them and they went out for review, so I had about 40 responses um, on various things and we took them to council to discuss because there were certain things um, that, um, there is a case, and Tim has actually done a blog on this at one point, you know, where um, and researchers are shocked to find out this, this happens, that when some editors can't find enough reviewers, they do the review themselves. But it, this is not clear to the researchers. So you could actually end up with the decision being made by the editor, there's only one reviewer, and even the editor is all that. So in those guidelines, we actually ha put, put, put a sentence in that that should be done transparently, so that the editor should declare it. They can either put their name to the um, editorial letter and say they've done this, or actually do it on an online system so it's recorded, but everyone knows. Um, and <laughs> A lot of editors said to me, but if we can't do that, we won't be able to get decisions on manuscripts in time. <laughs> and we thought, well, that's just not acceptable, you know. So council voted that we would have this in because, you know, being an editor can be tough, you know, and you do make enemies. But fairness is absolutely crucial, and especially you want to, to, to get the respect of, of your community. So there has to be editor transparency, which is why it's, I'm very keen on the editorial decision letter being published. Not, you know, people say editorial correspondence. That's too extreme because there's loads of stuff. It's, some of it is mundane, some is very sensitive. It's not appropriate for it to be published. But the editorial decision letter where the editor lays out why they've made this decision and also direction on revision. The most useless thing an editor can do is say, oh, please address the reviewer's comments and then send me a revised manuscript. Worse than useless, you know. Um, so editorial, uh, editor transparency is really, really important. Just dumb. Sorry, just quickly, just to answer you, like your question about a journal that might do this, ELIF's a good example, right? They, so they work together to collaborate on a decision letter, review as an editor, that is then sent to the, the reviewer. So, sorry. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if, I can't remember if ELIF actually published like this synthesis of the review reports as their decision letter. It may be whether the reviewers agree to it, but they... Yeah, I think, I think that's there. And EMBO will also um, explain their decision as well. And then there are different degrees of transparency. I think it comes back to this idea that transparency is very shaded um, because um, PLOS, I think, will op operate um, single blind, but they'll name the handling editor. So the handling editor gets 
named and, and that's the recognition for the editor and and accountability that you know that person has been at the helm so yeah there are different shades to transparency again that's a really important point that elizabeth has raised and, and i'm a great believer and at my journal we always used to do it that the the person who had made the decision their name went below it so you have accountability and response responsibility because a lot of journals don't tell you who has handled the actual manuscript um, and so, yes, I'm a great proponent of that. Yeah, good point. I was just going to add, I think, Carly, I'm right in saying that the Crossref um, uh, peer review ability is going to include the editor's letter as one of the things that can get a DOI. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that will again help with some of the transparency around this. Uh, any other comments from the audience before we move on? Yeah. Hi, my name is Mirsiha. I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I um, have, uh, although I'm an early stage researcher, I have already an experience in open peer review. I have been reviewing for, for, for peer J, and I want to ask Andrew why I can't um, uh, add my um, open review from peer J to Publins. I tried a few minutes ago and I couldn't. And I have to say, um, as a mentee of Professor Marišić, I was um, very, very early exposed in uh, peer review, and she mentored me through my first peer reviews. And uh, my first open uh, peer review was uh, scary in the beginning, but everything is so transparent, and editors' decisions are transparent, uh, but afterwards, it was such a re rewarding experience because as an early stage researcher, I could see what other uh, two peer reviewers have said about the paper and I could compare what I have seen with uh, their opinions. So I'm a total fan of open peer review. Thank you. Well, and we're going to put you right on the spot, Andrew, if you're okay with that. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Uh, you should absolutely be able to, so maybe we should talk about it after this and see what went wrong. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that's the goal, to make it easy. Um, just to the second part, um, talking about learning to peer review and um, the benefit of working with a supervisor to, to teach you how to do review, whether open review or otherwise. I think that's really important. Um, it, it's, a, it's a big initiative for us at the moment to, to train reviewers teach them how to review um, and, I, and I do think that the relationship you have with your supervisor should play a big role in the way that you, you learn how to review. It seems that it, it really helps to give confidence to, to early career researchers and what they're putting out there. So I think that's, that's really good learning and something that we aim to support with, with what we're doing. So does that... I would sorry, never what? ever... Uh, have done an open peer review if, had, if it wasn't for my supervisor. Yeah. So this is actually a really good segue into our next question that we received earlier on Twitter, which is about are there particular challenges for early career researchers in, um, if, who are being asked to do open peer review? And I think Irene... Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't think anyone should be forced to do open peer review. And I, I also think that early career researchers have a right to to make the decision that they don't feel comfortable um, having their name released. And, you know, I've heard some sort of horror stories, you know, about this aspect, so I'm very sympathetic to early career researchers. But I think one way around it is to review with their supervisors and have joint, joint names on. But also I try and tell early career researchers particularly to not be afraid to contact editors and journals because a lot of them, like in the case I, I gave where their reviews were, they were told their reviews were no longer there. To contact the journal, have a conversation about this and, and explain the problem because a good editor will often find a solution and it's a case by case thing, you know, how each party can achieve what they need to um, without anyone ending up distressed or ha having problems in the future. Um, so I think it would depend on the situations how, how you did it, but I don't think they should be forced to release their, release their names. Then. I would, you know, if, if they can't resolve it, they should just decline to review, I think. But in a courteous way, 
Um, and unfortunately nowadays, you know, with the online systems, it's just a matter of sometimes of, you know, ticking a box. And I wonder, I don't know again if anyone's done any research on this, it's easier to decline to review than it used to be. And I think the, the journals that are doing personalized letters um, with a letter that is tailored to an individual, I wonder if their success rates are higher because I certainly respond to those kind of letters rather than the ones which just look sort of, sort of, sort of random. Yeah, and uh, I think I've been, I've heard Theo um, Bloom talk about this um, from the point of view of the BMJ operating open peer review and she sort of speculates whether openness is part of the answer as well as part of the problem. Um, and just what you were saying, Irene, that if you can be courteous and uh, phrase things very delicately and uh, constructively, um, and why didn't you use this test as opposed to this test, then maybe that is part of the answer and can ease people over some of those difficulties. I'll just mention that um, I think this is a potential issue for early career researchers more so than others, depending on the field and um, the types of colleagues that they tend to have. Uh, so I agree that it should be um, nothing necessarily forced, but certainly something that could be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but I think it speaks to the larger issue of uh, a lack of understanding about um, open science in general, but um, open peer review, transparency in peer review, and um, in the research community, in particular in early career researchers. And so I think having um, uh, advisors like the one that, um, that was mentioned that really um, takes the hand of and guides their um, kind of lab progeny to understand how to do these things and, and understand the importance of these things um, could really go a long way towards facilitating uh, not only opening up the peer review, but then also being able to make some judgment calls on a case-by-case -case basis as to how much, uh, what level of openness is appropriate for a given field or a given researcher. Okay, any comments from anybody else in the room? Yep, Elizabeth. Thanks, Elizabeth Siever from POS. I have so many thoughts, I'm gonna try and keep them brief. <laughs> One is in terms of making it um, too easy to decline to review. Um, I know for PLOS One, um, when we actually have somebody who bothers to click the link to decline to review, that's really doing us a favor. It seems like what a lot of people will do is a silent decline and just not answer. And so then we're left wondering, you know, did, did you get the email? Is it, is it us? You know, it's, it's, very, it's very confusing, right? And it's hard to know uh, what to extrapolate from that. Um, so that was thing one. And then um, in terms of early career researchers, certainly in the surveys I've done asking about attitudes um, towards signed review, published review, both senior, self-identified senior researchers and early career researchers are both worried about ECRs and these sorts of repercussions. But in some conversations that I've had, you know, face-to-face, um, -face, I've asked sort of follow-up questions like, okay, well, would you be okay if, um, you know, your uh, grad student wrote a paper that completely contradicted, um, you know, this big name in the field and published that? Like, would that be okay? And they're, they were like, well, absolutely. And so I wonder if part of it is that, um, you know, it's not that it's always bad for ECRs to go up against, you know, big names, if, I mean, it's overly simplistic anyway, um, but is it partly that because reviews aren't taken as seriously as these sorts of scholarly objects the way um, published research articles are, that it's just that there's this kind of risk potentially, but if they're not gonna get credit for their review, um, that, you know, why, why would they put themselves out there? And so I feel like, you know, that it's important to think about them, but um, I think if we can give more credit for reviews, we might be able to kind of do an end run around some of the dangers for uh, ECRs. Have we, uh, sorry, the, the lady standing up at the back, are you, have you got a question? You, there's a question here. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think mine was sort of more of a, a comment and maybe not particularly directly related to open peer review. Uh, by the way, I'm Melissa Vaught, I'm from uh, Maryland. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm hearing you talk about is the transparency in peer review in terms of making peer reviews open to, you know, visible to people with or without signing. Um, but I think from my perspective that the journals and the publishers 
um, should also be considering another element of transparency and peer review. And part of that is things around gender and geographic and institutional distributions of who they're inviting to peer review and who's accepting those peer reviews. And I think it's in particularly important to think about that now at an early stage before we're really getting to that point where c early career researchers and professors are actually starting to be in that position of getting credit for their peer reviews and that credit for their peer reviews being used in decisions about their tenure and promotion, for instance. Um, and I think you know, there's so little data that's available about the gender distribution. We're starting to get more of it, from example, from the AGU, but there's so little data that's out there about the percentage of peer reviewers. You know, when Nature at one point said, I think it was like 12% of their peer reviewers were women for a particular year. I mean, this is, this is a serious problem on multiple levels because there's the issue of getting credit, there's the issue of women getting experience doing peer review uh, and being able to be part of that peer review process. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, for me, that's a really major issue to think about and to think about if women are declining more frequently, why are they declining more frequently? Are they declining because it's, they are seeing things as being out of scope that are sort of at the edge of their expertise? Is it because of time? Um, so I don't know if there's a question buried in there, but. <laughs> well, I'm I, think, I think more people are doing work, and I know uh, Charles Fox, you know, the ecologist, he, they've in function, he's the editor-in-chief of Functional Ecology, has done some very nice work as well. I haven't had time to compare it to the AGU um, data. Have you, Tim, at all? You know, wh whether they cor correspond. But um, some of these things, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very complex issue, but when you look at what is happening with conference speakers, when they've done the research on that, there's often a very simple solution. So someone, I can't remember who it is who's done the, the analysis, but they looked at... Um, panels, you know, and there are a group of people now, um, men who are refusing to speak at certain panels that are all male, you know, they're making a stand. So people have looked at what increases the diversity of a panel, and, and this conference has been brilliant, hasn't it, because the diversity, you know, has, I mean, it's been such a... We have a token win. man on our panel. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Um, and for example, with, with conferences, it's if you have just one woman on the organising committee, that completely changes the compositions of, of panels. And that's quite an easy thing to do. Um, and again, on, uh, if anyone doesn't read the Dynamic Ecology blog, please go and read it. You don't need to be an e ecologist. They deal with gender issues, grant issues, early career uh, researchers. So again, Megan Duffy there has recently been posting ideas and people are thinking about it more. And just the instance that if you, if you respond quickly to someone who requests a name for you for someone to talk, you tend not to think of people, even women don't tend to think of women, but if you dwell on it and think, right, let me think on that, and then, then get back to someone because new names will come up and then to keep a record of that. And, and if we all start doing it in this way and creating an awareness, I think that will help. With women editors, because uh, when I ran a journal, and it was um, an influential journal, and we needed to have senior women on, we tried to create um, a, a good gender balance. The women declined more becoming editors because they were asked by so many other people also, and they took other commitments very seriously and tended not to be, wanted to be spread too thin. So we would have to plan ahead years. And if someone said to me, oh, I can't take that on now because I'm be, being made head of the institute, I would make a note of it when they were coming off. And then in two years ahead, contact them before other people leaked and said, I, I know you're coming to the end of your term there. We are still really interested. Would you join us as an editor? So I think it's, again, this kind of sort of engaging the head and realizing everyone's human and people want to feel appreciated, they also want people to realize, yeah, I'm too busy to do that, I would love to do it. And making it possible for that person to, to join you in some capacity, which again might be an individual thing, but it enables that person to do either reviewing or being an editor. So it's a great point to raise, but I think it's, it's, it's a complex one, but I think there's lots of solutions and everyone can do something in a little way to, to help you know, increase the proportions. I'll just add, there's something to be said for um, the tools that we use. 
and improving them. Um, you know, right now the way most um, editors, if they're going out and trying to find reviewers, find reviewers is you look at the corresponding authors on manuscripts. Maybe there are ways to expand um, uh, the range of people that we ask to review beyond just that pool of reviewers. Um, and an example of, I think, one of the issues that's going on, and it's not gender, but is um, country specific. Well, you know, one of the things we've seen is that there are a huge number of article submissions and publications from China, but much less review going on. And I see that as a, like a really a big problem. Um, if you look at the, the, the scale of it, that we need to solve a, as an industry. And so that would be another example of something that, that's really important right now. Hi, so I had a comment and a question. Uh, I'd start with saying uh, in terms of transparency, uh, there are two aspects, of course, there's the names uh, and the, uh, the report itself. Now, is there a way, one, to uh, analyze uh, a peer review report, whether a paper has been accepted or rejected, uh, to understand the quality of the peer reviewer from that? And if there is a metric that can be assigned for that, which would mean that there will be a higher ownership from the side of the peer reviewer, and uh, you know they can be held accountable by the journal editor. Also, are journals uh, resistant to transparency purely because there is an unwillingness to change, or is it something? Is there something deeper? Is it uh, that they will there be an increase in effort on their part, or perhaps uh, they don't think that peer reviewers will accept? their requests that much more because you know their names are being disclosed and the quality of their reviews are being disclosed. Uh, another thing, another point I wanted to make was uh, why should a peer reviewer really peer review? You know, if there's no, uh, I mean the recognition is only really just starting. Uh, institutions have not really, uh, you know, it's starting and they are kind of recognizing the peer reviewer and you know, uh, using that to promote them or whatever. But do does it mean that if you do a lot of peer reviews, you can be considered for a job in a journal later in your future? Or does that, is that something that can be incentivized? Uh, so I, I, we work for an, I work for an author services company and we have something called a rapid technical review, which is a pre-submission peer review, uh, which is catering to authors. And it tells authors how much water their paper really is in before they submit it to a journal. And we do incentivize uh, reviewers and these reviewers might not be recognized peer reviewers, but they are experienced in that subject area. Uh, so just, just wanted your thoughts on that. Was the first question about quality of review, of peer review, did you say that, asking about quality? There, are, there is a metric um, to measure or attempt to measure quality of peer review, but as you can imagine, it's one of those great sort of unsolved um, mysteries because it's quite subjective. And um, if we were to rate reports now, we probably wouldn't rate them the same. And that's, I think that's the main issue with quality. And then, of course, why are we measuring quality? Because we, we want to recognize that that's important. And just one high-quality review might mean more to a journal than 10 very quick, bland reviews. But we don't want to turn, sort of turn it into a competition either. So I think there's lots of, there's lots of issues at play there with respect to quality, Andrew? Yeah, can I, I'll just add to that. So with Publons, we do have a, a way of recognizing quality reviews, but there are a lot of kind of nuances you get into that you gotta be careful of. One thing is what happens for a low quality review? Is that like, what do you do for a reviewer where they get a low quality review? You don't wanna put somebody off and stop them from wanting to review again. It's a huge consideration. Um, and then the other thing is yeah, who, who, who rates the quality, who evaluates it. So we've looked at you know, getting feedback from the editor, getting feedback from the author, getting feedback from co-reviewers, possibly somebody else in the PubOns network. There are all these op opportunities, but at the end of the day, it, it all requires more work. And that's like the challenge. All of these things that we talk about require more work. And I think um, th that's one thing. But, but I, I would point out that, so we just had the Sentinel Awards go live today. And one of the categories there was people who have done excellent reviews and recognizing them for that. So I think it's, it's a really important thing, but it's not a simple thing. And while there's also the, there's the, like the, the concept of high quality reviews, another thing that comes up a lot is just giving feedback to reviewers. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that we don't talk about enough. 
you know, whether a reviewer is good or not, letting a reviewer know that they're doing a good job or there's things that they need to improve at um, is, is probably just as important as purely quality of review. You might also want to look at periods of science because one of the motivations for Yana Sapana setting up periods of science was as a postdoc, he would complete reviews and then feel like he had no feedback from the journal. How, how was that review perceived? And periods of science is about peer review of peer review. So it's a, an open platform. Reviewers can um, sort of be self-selected. There's no editor-led peer review in that scheme. Um, and reviewers can agree to review manuscripts that are of interest to them. And then the funny thing about the process is that once they've submitted their reviews, they can rate the other reviewers' reviews. And I said, I've asked him, how does that work? And he said, well, it's one of the quickest parts of the process because reviewers are really keen to see what other reviewers did and rate them. So you might want to look at that platform and how he, he's developed that. I think quality, quality is a, a, a it's really important issue, and it is very nuanced, and it is very difficult, because as an editor, you also get to know, you know, you've got hard reviewers and soft reviewers, so you could send them the same manuscript, and you've got um, a review from each of them. One could be raving about it, and the other one just says, it's, it's good, and you know actually that person, because they're tough, that is a really good manuscript. And again, this is getting to know your community, getting to know your reviewers. They're just not people on an online system. You know, you've interacted with them. And each, lots of journals go through this exercise um, on an annual basis, because like at my journal, we used to um, reward the best reviewers of, of the year. But we, we didn't do it by looking you know, at numbers or some calculation, it was quite, um, uh, an intelligent process where you went in, you looked at people who had done reasonable numbers, but that you actually, we then actually read their reports again to see what their reviews were like. Because it's, and that wasn't scored, because if you've got a board of, um, like we had 25 editors on our board, getting them to assess and put a number against the quality of um, a manuscript isn't often a good indicator of quality, because again, you've got harder, softer people, um, they have different kinds of manuscripts. Um, sometimes the problem lies with the way the manuscript is, is presented, so you don't get a good, um, as good as a review as you could. And, th and this is another one of the things where you get wastages. And again, I've heard reviewers complaining that they're doing the editor's job, that the kind of screening that should go on with every manuscript before it's sent out for review doesn't always occur. Part of it may be lack of um, experience, but it's also a time thing. So nothing should be sent out to a reviewer using their valuable time that is incomplete, that the language is such a standard that is incomprehensible. We're not talking things that are, are not in perfect English, but you can work out the research, you can assess the science or whatever discipline it is. It's stuff that is, again, just you cannot understand. So again, early career researchers, fret and they spent hours trying to understand it and so I advise them always get back to that journal and again a courteous letter you're interacting with the um, editor you may have a relationship with this editor for, for, for many years and just explain that oh, you know you would love to review this manuscript but you find it impossible because you cannot actually understand the research or the methodology and that shouldn't even have, have gone out so we have enormous wastage there and if anyone does review a paper in that kind of um, cond condition, they're not going to be able to do a good review. So you'll end up a reviewer who is actually very good, not being able to do a quality review. And next time, especially more experienced senior people, they're just turned down, rejecting that person's manuscripts. And people build up negative reputations, um, groups do, and also individuals. And some reviewers, even before they've seen the paper, they will say, I'm not going to review anything from that group again. And it could be for a variety of reasons. And again, that's a difficult situation. There has to be improvement that made, and that's a diplomatic job that a journal or an editor has to do to, again, make sure that next time that manuscript that comes in is in much better, better shape. And Carly, I'd be interested, um, the sort of second part of your question, I think, was about incentives for reviewers. And we've heard a lot about um, for journals, but actually I think it'd be really interesting to hear about what the what incentives are any um, you use in the grant application process and how you manage that kind of quality issue as well. Well, um, the 
as I said, the Moore Foundation might be a little bit different from a lot of the funders that um, fund uh, research in um, the context of this meeting, but uh, when it comes to uh, review processes for us, when we do have those processes in place, uh, we tend to pay honoraria. And that, of course, is a great incentive for folks, but also um, as a funder, it's very easy to get people to do things for you because they're hopeful that you'll think of them next time you have um, a, a project or a call for proposals or um, a pot of money that you're, that you're looking to give away. And so I think, um, you know, in some sense, it is about knowing your community and knowing um, who, who the people are that are gonna be able to contribute good ideas to uh, or, or improve upon grants that you get or proposals that you get. Um, but I think this question of incentives is, um, it's broader than just being able to, you know, pay people honoraria. I think it's a lot, it's a lot more about changing the way that we think about um, incentivizing science more broadly. And of course, in a, a publisher-focused conference, um, it's probably not as popular to say that we should um, steer away from traditional publications and think more about other types of outputs. But certainly, um, having tools and um, processes in place that take into account the fact that people, some people do spend a lot of time reviewing a manuscript and they really want to make sure that they're contributing back to their community and figuring out ways to um, not necessarily quantify that, but just be able to capture it and um, provide credit for people that are doing that extra bit of work, um, either in the tenure and promotion process or in the grant review process or um, you know, in, in some other aspect that's gonna benefit their work and make them feel like part of the community and more willing to contribute. Okay, well, we're nearly out of time. I just want to check if there's anything on Twitter before we go to our final question. Any comments or anything? And Okay. Is this, is this I, a quick one? Yes, quick question. Actually, a comment. Laura Getz, uh, Chicago. Uh, I'm managing editor of an orthopedic journal. Uh, orthopedics is largely dominated by white men, and so I wanted to speak about the point of diversity in uh, the reviewer pool and in editorships, and also to Irene's point that we have the power to do something, and when we can, we should. Uh, we recently had a meeting with the editor-in-chief uh, and I pointed out as courteously as possible that on both the review deputy editor board and the research uh, board, there were no women. Not even the pediatrics uh, deputy editor was a woman, which is the only place we've had a woman on the editorial board before. Um, he was chagrined and by the end of the day, he had gotten recommendations from colleagues about two women, and we have two women coming on the editorial board in January, so we do have the power. The other comment I wanted to make was a distinction between the terms sex and gender. This is my first peer-reviewed Congress. I've been noticing people uh, using the term gender when I think what they mean generally is biologic sex, and I just wondered if that's something that, that people uh, doing the research are thinking about, if they're defining that in their studies. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I'm, we could, just because we're running out of time, I'm going to say, sort of answer that on everybody's behalf, I think, which is to say probably the answer to your second question is not as much as we should be, so thank you for raising it. Um, we thought of a nice last question for everybody would be, okay, imagine you have a fabulous grant from, say, the Moore Foundation to um, do some research into peer review. What would be your fantasy bit of research to, to carry out with unlimited <coughs> funds into uh, something that will make peer review better? Oh, you're asking us. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, this is, well, I, I mean, the people in the audience as well, if, if anybody in the audience has, uh, has ideas, please. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Well, I'll, I'll kick things off. Um, I want to bring together two themes that we've discussed today. First one is quality of review and also the difficulty of measuring it, but then also training. And so one of the things we have with Publons is the Publons Academy, where we have an online course that teaches you the core competencies of peer review and you then work with your supervisor to write a review. Um, subsequently, we then connect you with the editors so you can start reviewing. But what we don't know yet is whether that actually improves the quality of review. You, you gotta hope it does, but I would love to do a study on you know, the effect of training for reviewers on quality of review. It's something that David Mower spoke about, I guess, yes, yesterday or Monday. Um, 
Yesterday was Monday. Um, <laughs> yesterday or Sunday. Um, but I think that would be a really interesting study for somebody to, to take on. And any audience suggestions? Sorry, I should have asked you all first. Yeah, I, uh, so we're talking a lot about peer review that happens before publication and with the goal of increasing the quality of the research that's out there and with the goal of improving the reviews so that the author's manuscripts get better so that they're able to be published if they aren't um, already publishable when they come to the, to the journal. Um, but um, I'd be interested to do some research to say, look at more collaboration and more moving peer review way earlier to when someone's deciding what to research and what their protocol would be and how they're going to go about it that could shorten the times uh, that it takes for someone to go through the review process because you've gone way earlier and saved a lot of time and possibly eliminate a whole lot of waste um, of going over many, many um, uh, manuscripts that just frankly aren't publishable because the science isn't good. Is that the registered report format? Are you familiar with that? So uh, the, the idea that you um, sort of do a two-stage peer review, so not, not on what results you found, but on whether your setup was um, sound, ethical, um, would address the research question. Um, because there is a registered report format and a results-free peer review, which is very similar, that, that might um, be what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Pinsoft does that, right? The, is it the Rio Journal? Yeah. Yeah, we've got a few. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, given huge amounts of money and time and... Uh, I would love to do a study where you took three, four hundred papers um, and you actually, for a, in the same paper, was reviewed double blind, single blind, and open, unbeknownst to anybody, any of the other reviewers. And I would love to compare how those review processes turned out because I think we haven't done that. We don't know what that would look like because it's okay to say this journal's open, this journal's closed, and it's different. You're not controlling for journal or for paper, and you, to to do it where you control for the paper and the journal and the context, but you just change the the review process that's happening on the paper. I think that would be really cool. But I don't have any money. But of course, you'd be changing the reviewers then, so you'd have to figure that out. Okay, yeah. <laughs> one more time for one more, please. Um, Manish Kumari from the University of Split and the University of Amsterdam. Um, we have so many published reports already, and if we're really talking fast-forward future, ideally we would use those to develop artificial intelligence that would be able to do peer review for many of the works. You know, if you had a machine learning that could check checklists for what is or is not published in uh, papers, and you know, you said risk of bias, systematic reviews. We've seen in papers in presented here that in two Cochrane reviews, the same study is evaluated differently by risk of bias by different people. So obviously we are very, human errors happen more than you'd like to admit. So I think we need, for this amount of data, and for all of this that we have, a lot more machine and computer science help to speed this up. Because obviously we're not making it in time for many things. And if we, if we did have pre-printed servers, which are ideal for many things, you could have versioning, we have DOI versioning already, um, versions of record, improvement of a paper already after the first peer review, after the second, after the 15th, and then not necessarily needing a publication in a journal, I'm not saying getting rid of journals, but it's, you know, with possibilities of technology today, if someone would invest in that, we would solve a lot of other problems um, of data. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, that's a great note to end on, I think. I would like to say thank you to everybody who has been following along on Twitter, and big thanks to all of you here in the room. You've actually been a really great, engaged, um, interactive audience, and we, I, well, I really appreciate it. I'm sure we all do. Um, so thank you very much indeed, and happy peer review week. Thank you. Thanks.